Welcome back to Student to Stud. Today we will go over humeral shaft fractures and everything you should know as a medical student. Here's the basic outline on what we'll be discussing today. Time for the first case. How would you read these x-rays? We have two views of the left humerus demonstrating a displaced mid to distal humeral shaft segmental fracture with varus angulation. We will shortly go over the different ways that you can treat humeral shaft fractures, but this fracture was treated non-operatively and was initially placed in a co-optation splint. Humeral shaft fractures occur in the elderly population and young population. You need to keep pathologic fractures on the radar. Do you know the five cancers that metastasize to the bone? You can remember the five types of cancers with the mnemonic PB, KTL, or lead kettle. These are prostate, breast, kidney, thyroid, and lung. On physical exam, the patient will have pain, swelling, possible deformity, with possible shortening. You must evaluate their neurovascular status. Most importantly, is there a radial nerve working? Radial nerve palsies would manifest with a wrist drop. The first muscle to recover after a radial nerve palsy is the brachioradialis muscle. The last muscle to recover is the extensor indices. This comes down to innervation and the location on where they receive their innervation. Radial nerve palsies are estimated to occur between 7 to 17 percent with humeral shaft fractures, making them the most common nerve injury in long bone fractures. Additionally, patients treated initially conservative had a reported nerve recovery of 70 to 70 percent in some studies, and with late surgical exploration of the nerve that didn't recover after initial conservative management, they had a rate of recovery of 68 percent. If the radial nerve is transected or lacerated, it would be best to manage this surgically to prevent nerve scarring and retraction and muscular atrophy. And like always, you need to check if the fracture is closed or open. When treating humeral shaft fractures, you must know everything about the radial nerve. Let's now go over some of the most important aspects of the radial nerve that you should know. The radial nerve is derived from the posterior cords of the brachial plexus with contributions from C5 through T1. The radial nerve runs in the spiral groove of the humerus and traverses along the posterior aspect of the humerus for 6.5 centimeters. The radial nerve can be found 20 centimeters proximal to the medial apocondyle and 14 centimeters from the lateral epicondyle. These are favorite pimp questions that you will surely be asked about while on rotations. I remember getting these questions multiple times on my rotations. Next, the radial nerve enters the intermuscular septum and runs between the brachialis and the brachioradialis. On the right, you can see the radial nerve divides into two terminal branches at the level of the radial head. The terminal branches are the superficial radial nerve and the posterior interosseous nerve. Do you know what a Holstein-Lewis fracture is? A Holstein-Lewis fracture is a spiral distal third humeral shaft fracture with a radial nerve palsy. Spiral distal third humeral shaft fractures have a 22% incidence of radial nerve neuropraxias. Another nerve that you should be aware of is the axillary nerve. The axillary nerve is located 5 to 6 centimeters below the acromion. This is important to remember with your surgical approach. The main artery that supplies the humeral shaft is the main nutrient artery, which enters at the mid to distal third aspect. The upper half of the humeral shaft has great blood supply from the ascending branch and accessory arteries, which may help to explain why metastatic lesions favor this aspect of the humerus. Radiographs of the entire humerus should be obtained. You should include the shoulder and elbow. If you want to further characterize the fracture, you can perform a traction view. Like always, you can obtain a CT scan to further characterize the fracture. MRIs are reserved for pathologic fractures or fractures with malignant characteristics. Next, we'll go over the non-operative tolerances. The non-operative tolerances for humeral shaft fractures are less than 20 degrees of angulation in the sagittal plane, less than 30 degrees of angulation in the coronal plane, and less than 3 centimeters of shortening. Conservative therapy will be difficult in those who are obese and short. When you place these fractures in a brace, the combination of gravity and the brace causes an increase in hydrostatic pressure which helps with fracture alignment. These fractures have a high rate of union, exceeding 90% with conservative care. On average, union occurs 9 to 14 weeks after the injury. 
There are several conservative management options. You can place the patient in a hanging arm cast. This treatment is best for displaced spiral or oblique mid-shaft humeral fractures. The issue with this technique is that it can cause over-distraction. The patient must sleep in a semi-erect position because you cannot put any support on the elbow when sleeping. I personally have not seen this treatment used in practice. Next is the coaptation splint. This splint will be the workhorse splint used for these injuries. They are best for fractures that are minimally short or fractures that are short oblique or transverse in orientation. The fractures have a high tendency of falling into varus in extension, so you must mold them into valgus. The issue that arises with this splint is axillary irritation and shortening. This is because when you place the cooptation splint, you must place the medial side into the axillary fold and the lateral side of the splint as high up onto the neck as you can. Obesity and patients with large breasts are contraindications to using a cooptation splint as they will fall into varus at the fracture site. After one or two weeks from the time of injury, you can transition the patient to a sarmanto brace, which will look like a clamshell. It surrounds the arm, and it can be taken off if needed to perform hygiene. This brace allows for shoulder and elbow range of motion to decrease joint stiffness. If the patient has a radial nerve palsy and observation is chosen, you will need to brace the patient's wrist and fingers into extension to prevent flexion contractures from forming. There are many operative indications that you will read about, but the absolute surgical indications are vascular injury, severe soft tissue injury inhibiting conservative treatment, compartment syndrome, open fractures, and floating elbow injuries. Studies have demonstrated that open reduction internal fixation of distal third humeral shaft fractures have a more predictable alignment than conservative therapy. Surgery has a quicker return to function, but it does risk reoperation and iatrogenic injury to the radial nerve. Studies have also demonstrated that non-unions are more common in oblique and spiral fracture patterns. There are three main surgical procedures that can be used, external fixation, open reduction internal fixation, and intramedullary nail. External fixators will be used in damage control orthopedics to stabilize an unstable patient until definitive fixation can be performed. Open reduction internal fixation can be performed with a compression plate or bridge plate. There is a more predictable alignment with surgery, but you have an increased risk of infection, iatrogenic injury to the radial nerve, and reoperation when you choose surgery. A 4-5 mm plate is superior to a 3-5 mm plate. When you use a compression plate, your goal is to place four bicortical screws on either side of the fracture site. Bridge plating will be used if there is a significant amount of comminution. Intramedullary nails can be used. One contraindication to using a nail is if there is a radial nerve palsy because the nerve could be entrapped in the fracture site and you would inadvertently damage the nerve when you use your reamer and place the nail. Nails have a higher rate of complication. They have a higher rate of malreduction, decreased range of motion postoperatively, it is important to remember that nails are load sharing devices and that if there is a large difference between the implant and the metaphyseal diameter, it can lead to instability and will go on to delayed union or non-union. When you place your distal locking screws from medial to lateral, the radial nerve is at risk. When you place your screws anterior to posterior, the muscular cutaneous nerve is at risk. There are two ways of placing your nail, antegrade and retrograde. Antigrade violates the rotator cuff and can cause shoulder pain and stiffness. Retrograde nails have an increased risk of causing a supracondylar fracture, which is most common in young females with narrow medullary canals. So we discussed earlier in this presentation the relatively high incidence of radial nerve palsy. There are some specific indications on when you should explore a radial nerve palsy and when you should not. Open humeral shaft fractures with a radial nerve palsy is an indication to explore the radial nerve. A study by Bishop found that the radial nerve had an increased risk of being transected in open humeral shaft fractures. They found that when the radial nerve was not explored, the radial nerve had a recovery rate less than 40%. Another indication on exploring the radial nerve is if conservative care has failed for 3-6 to six months. There is controversy if you should explore radial nerve palsy after closed reduction. 
The current consensus is that you do not need to. You will be able to find papers that argue both sides, so it is important to read multiple studies before making a decision on how you will treat these patients. The incidence of radial nerve injury increases the more distal the fracture site. When treating radial nerve palsies conservatively, you should perform a baseline EMG at three to six weeks from the time of injury. If the radial nerve is still out, you can repeat the EMG at 12 weeks. Some physicians will elect to perform an ultrasound to see if the radial nerve is intact or transected. We will talk about two surgical approaches used for open reduction internal fixation, the anterior lateral and posterior approach. The anterior lateral approach will be most commonly used in proximal third to mid third humeral shaft fractures. The incision will be from the deltopectoral groove and extended to the lateral border of the long heads of the biceps. You will split the brachialis. Remember that the brachialis has dual innervation. The lateral aspect of the muscle is innervated by the radial nerve and the medial aspect is innervated by the muscular cutaneous nerve. Additionally, the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve, which is a continuation of the muscular cutaneous nerve, must be exposed medially between the brachial and the biceps muscle. Remember, the radial nerve runs between the brachial and the brachial radialis muscle. It must be protected during this approach. We will now discuss the posterior approach. This approach will most commonly be used in the middle third to distal third humeral shaft fractures. The incision will be straight posterior and either split the triceps muscle or go around the triceps. You must identify the radial nerve during this approach and the profunda brachii artery. You must protect these vital structures throughout the case. We will now turn our attention towards some potential complications when treating humeral shaft fractures. The most common complications are injury to the radial nerve. Nonunions can occur. If there is no callus formed at six weeks, there is 100% specificity and positive predictive value that the fracture will go on to a nonunion. Risk factors for developing a nonunion include fracture distraction, soft tissue interposition at the fracture site, low grade infection, smoking, the use of anti inflammatory medications, and inadequate immobilization. And like previously discussed, a varus malunion can occur. These malunions are most likely when conservative treatment is chosen. On the right, you can see an example of what this malunion would look like. And as always, infection is a risk with surgical intervention. Let's finish off our discussion with one more practice case. How would you read these x-rays? We have two views of the left humerus demonstrating a mid-shaft spiral fracture with gross distraction. How would you initially treat this injury? I would initially treat this injury in placing the patient in a coaptation splint. Unfortunately, after the patient was placed in a coaptation splint, the fracture site demonstrated gross distraction. This fracture was then treated with a plate and went on to heal nicely. Let's finish our discussion with some pimp questions. Question 1. Varus or valgus mold when placing a coaptation splint? Valgus. What is the first muscle to recover with a radial nerve palsy? Brachioradialis. What is the incidence of radial nerve palsy with a Holstein Lewis fracture? 22%. The lowest rate of reoperation, open reduction versus a nail. Open reduction internal fixation has the lowest rate of reoperation. Question 5. What is the surgical tolerances for humeral shaft fractures? 20 degrees anterior posterior, 30 degrees varus valgus, and shortening less than 3 centimeters. What is the last muscle to recover with a radial nerve palsy? Extensor indices. The muscular cutaneous nerve is at risk with distal locking screws placed in which direction? Anterior posterior. The radial nerve is at risk with placing distal locking screws placed in which direction? Lateral to medial. If the patient has a radial nerve palsy, should you brace their wrist and hand? If so, in what position? You should brace their hand. You should brace their wrist and fingers into extension to prevent a flexion contracture. How many centimeters does the radial nerve run directly posterior on the humeral shaft? Approximately 6.5 centimeters. The radial nerve runs how many centimeters proximal to the lateral epicondyle? 14 centimeters. And that's all for humeral shaft fractures. Until next time, thank you for listening and hopefully that was helpful. Be sure to give us a thumbs up or leave us a comment so we can better serve you.